Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IPR's first seminar of the year. My name is Charles Larkin. I'm the Director of Research at the Institute for Policy Research. And today we have with us Dr. Stephen Hall, uh, a lecturer in post-Soviet and Russian politics uh, at the University of Bath, uh, who will be speaking, us uh, speaking to us today about his latest book, The Authoritarian International, Tracing How Authoritarian Regimes Learn in the Post-Soviet Space. We will also be joined today from uh, North Dakota by Professor Thomas Ambrosio and from King's College London, the acting director of the Russian Institute, Professor Gulnaz Sharafutinova. Uh, I hope I did that as best I could there. Um, and uh, they will be also commenting on Stephen's book today. So without further ado, I hand over to Stephen, who will be giving us a slide presentation on his book and then our two respondents, and then it will be open to questions from you, the audience. Please remember to put your questions into the Q&A function and that your uh, microphones and your cameras will be turned off for the duration of, uh, of this seminar. And the seminar is being recorded and will be published online subsequently. So with that, Stephen, please, uh, please begin your presentation. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Charles, and thank you also for the to the Institute for Policy Research at Bath and to Gunas and, and Tom. My book, which came out with Cambridge University Press uh, in May 2023, looks at how authoritarian regimes learn and develop best survival practices. I'm going to make that more succinct by just talking about autocracies, because saying authoritarian regimes every time would take up a lot of time. Um, and I'd like to begin by obviously pointing out that when I sent this to Cambridge University Press, um, it was Putin had just begun his invasion of or full scale invasion of Ukraine. And so the title that includes the post-Soviet space, I don't want to cause anyone any offence over that label. Uh, we still haven't reached a um, an idea of quite how to define the region at the moment, whether to make it smaller regions such as the South Caucasus and Central Asia, um, or to use an acronym of the first letters of every uh, country within the region. I'll try and refer to it as the region, but if I slip back into the post-Soviet space, I apologize, no offense to anyone. So yes, thank you very much about that. Um, this now isn't, ah, here we go. Okay, so in terms of the outline, what I want to ex briefly explain is the choice of case studies, why I chose the region that I did and the four countries that I did, I want to look at a bit of theory. I don't want to bore you too much on a Tuesday evening or uh, or Tuesday afternoon in Tom's case, um, but to try and develop uh, learning theory a little bit. Then looking at the findings of the book and potentially some policy implications and conclusions. So without further ado, when looking at authoritarian regimes, it's difficult to get inside the black box and one has to go around the houses as it were to try and find um, information about learning these regimes don't advertise what they're doing so one has to look at different uh, find personnel within the regimes follow them in the news as to what they're doing or what they've been doing and also to ascertain policy implications and legislation so Trying to find this information can be difficult, but I thought that this, hopefully the book has at least begun to ask some questions. There is, of course, a lot more to be done, um, but I thought that the book provides some understanding of how autocracies learn. So the case selection, when looking at the post-Soviet space, Russia is obviously the go-to country in regards to this, the regional hegemon, the one that is considered in the literature to be the teacher, the social teacher-student paradigm, like in a university where Russia teaches others how to implement autocratic best survival practices. What I wanted to see was to look at another authority, autocracy, and one that also provides learning capacity. 
And there could have been options, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, but I chose Belarus under Alexander Lukashenko, a person who has provided lessons for the Kremlin, I would argue. He did instigate his preventative counter-revolution against the color revolutions from 2000 to 2005 before the Kremlin. And some of what the Kremlin used was taken directly from Belarus. And then there are the so-called authoritarian-minded leaders. I'm not saying that Ukraine is an autocracy. To my mind, Ukraine is a weak democracy. But there have been periods where there have been attempted autocratic consolidation, personified by this man, Viktor Yanukovych, um, who was president until he fled Kiev in 2014. And then in Moldova, there was the cartel of Vladimir Plahotnyuk, the gentleman without the tie, and Igor Dodon, the gentleman with the tie, who were trying to or trying to consolidate power. Plahotnyuk was known as the Grey Cardinal or the puppeteer in Moldova, using his oligarch, his finances as an oligarch, as a businessman, to buy up the judiciary politicians from across the political spectrum and therefore to manipulate the political system for his own interests. And Dodon played a particularly key role in regards to this. The case selection for the book runs from 2000. I chose this primarily because it's the perfect date. Putin comes to power. Lukashenko has more or less consolidated autocracy. The former president of Ukraine, Leonid Kushma, wins re-election in 2001 and goes on an journey of autocratic consolidation and also Vladimir Voronin comes to power in Moldova the first elected communist party leader in the region to do so uh, and we see that there is autocratic consolidation in Moldova Vlahodnyuk is actually his purse he is the financier and Adon is also key within the Voronin regime as well in terms of moving on to the theory um Starting with a definition of authoritarian learning from Tom and our, uh, Tom and myself's article from 2017, that authoritarian learning is a process in which autocracies adopt survival strategies based upon prior successes and failures of other governments. And I think that Tom and I, when we were looking at this, were looking principally at external learning, learning from external aspects. What the book does is to say, yes, this is important, crucial, of course, but authoritarian learning also figures on the internal, that some autocracies learn from internal examples, primarily using the cases of Ukraine and Moldova. Many of the elites in, let's say, the Yanukovych regime came from the Kushma regime, or, for, when, or the Poroshenko regime came from the Kushma and Yanukovych regimes. So they took ideas from those previous regimes and implemented them under Poroshenko or Yanukovych, what have you. So internal learning is important, and I'm going to talk about that later. Within learning, we have diffusion, the spread of ideas, put it, to put it simply. We also have, I would argue, linkage. Levitsky and Wei have talked about linkage and leverage, primarily about democracies and the leverage democracies, the linkage democracies have with autocracies and the leverage democracies have over autocracies to try and bring those autocrats to a democratic transition. I argue that leverage doesn't really work in auto in autocracies. Very few very few autocrats are willing to uh, implement what they are told to do, but linkage is key. The networks of autocracies, and again, we'll come into to talk about that in more detail, no doubt. There's also adaptation. So the process of adjusting to different conditions. Autocracies, autocrats don't want to be the next Mumma Gaddafi, dragged through the streets of Misrata and beaten to death with lead piping. They would quite like to be Spain's Francisco Franco, dying peacefully at the ripe old age in their beds. Um, or Antonio Salazar as well in Portugal. So autocrats are constantly having to adapt because they constantly feel threatened. And they want to try and make sure that they can develop the best survival practices to stay in power and not face a Gaddafi moment. There's also emulation. 
This is the idea of matching or surpassing what others have done. You want to keep up with the Joneses, or even better, you want to do better than the Joneses. And this is certainly the case for autocrats as well, that they want to be the best. Very few autocrats actually say that they have learned from others. Putin is actually in a different is an alter, is an example of this. He has said that he took he appreciates Islam Karimov of Uzbekistan for how Karimov put down the Andijan massacre, it, the Andijan protests in 2005. There's also policy learning. Um, I don't want to go into de too much detail about the differences between policy learning and policy transfer, but ultimately policy learning is when policymakers compare external and internal policies from different states primarily um, and implement them accordingly. And we can see this in terms of authoritarian learning within the post-Soviet region in terms of the Commonwealth of Independent States Interparliamentary Assembly, which Edward Limon and Oleg Antonov have talked about, um, that this organization has a database where if you're, for instance, per, a regime personnel in Yerevan, you can go to the CIS IPA and read about how the Kazakh legislation, how it deals with external media funding and this sort of thing, or civil society in Belarus, and you can implement it accordingly. In terms of policy transfer, it is looking at policies between state structures. So how policies have been implemented in, let's say, the Ministry of the Economy, and how they can be used in the Finance Ministry, or in other parts of the state as well. So this is the in-depth learning theory. A little bit more. Uh, theory is again focused on the wider literature where it was at the time. Authoritarian learning, when I first began this research, to a great extent still said that because something happens in state B, C and D fairly quickly after it happened in state A, there is learning. Um, this, I think, was has been developed a lot more since I started the uh, PhD way back in 2015. Um, and we've seen the literature on authoritarian gravity centers develop as well. And this is represented by the solar system. For instance, within the region, you would have Russia as the sun, and then you would have other autocracies. So Russia would be the model that other autocracies would want to follow. Again, this teacher-student paradigm that we can see. And other autocrats, like Lukashenko in Belarus, being the first planet, then you would have either... Armenia or Kazakhstan as the second or third planets, and then you could decide where you go with Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, possibly even Hungary under Viktor Orban, as to where they all sit in this interplanetary system with Russia as the centre, and they all roads lead to Moscow, they take ideas from Moscow, this sort of thing. This is the authoritarian gravity centres model. I think it's relevant, but I don't think it tells the whole story of authoritarian learning. And you also have authoritarian promotion as well, um, where you have this idea that some countries, so-called autocratic models, again, Russia is a prime example, China is another one, promote autocracy to other regimes within their region or even further afield. This is, I think, relevant and certainly gives understanding to the literature. However, I follow the rubric of authoritarian bolstering. This is primarily because Putin, the idea in the post-Soviet space is that Putin promotes autocracy to places like Belarus and Kazakhstan, but Lukashenko and Nazarbayev were already in power before Putin came to power. So it isn't necessarily promotion, but rather bolstering, as Tom has written about as well. So this is the theory, this is where the framework comes in and what I wanted to try and do in terms of really getting into the detail of understanding authoritarian learning. So in terms of the findings, what I can say is for my, for my, for my research, learning is to a great extent horizontal. Not all roads lead to Moscow. That because autocracies are worried, understandably, about losing power, because it tends to be very bad for an autocrat when power is lost, 
tends to be terminal, um, they are willing to learn from each other. And Russia is willing to take examples from Azerbaijan, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan, from Belarus, in order to enhance the capacity of the Kremlin or the Putin system to survive. So learning, in my mind, is far more horizontal than is being considered, which saw it as almost top down to a great extent. The level of networks is extensive. That again, there was a focus on the presidential level, I found, or certain, or maybe in the higher echelons of the regime. What I found from tracing different people within each regime, from uh, finding out about who they met and such things, these networks are extensive that they go from across the presidential administration, the security councils, the security services, the interior ministries, the defense ministries, even as far down as possibly the Orthodox Church and businesses and the foreign ministry. Ambassadors particularly play a key role in establishing networks, primarily Russia's ambassadors to Belarus, Moldova and Ukraine. And also these networks aren't just at the high parts of the ministerial level, but they go down to deputy ministers, first deputy ministers, and probably even further. But finding data on this was a challenge. So, again, this is something else that others can do in the future. In terms of internal learning, I believe that this is crucial to understanding from places where, as Henry Hale would call, call it, there are multiple pyramids of power that internal learning is particularly important in weak autocracies or countries where there are authoritarian-minded elites like Moldova, like Ukraine, where personnel move from regime to regime and they take what they learned from the Kushma regime to the Yanukovych regime to the Poroshenko regime, less so to the Zelensky regime, but nevertheless, um, this is where, where we are today. So internal learning, I think, provides an interesting understanding, expands our understanding of authoritarian learning, certainly. Also, learning from success is important. We see that much focus has been, on, understandably, on learning from failure. We, we can see when generally aut autocracies fail. It tends to be fairly spectacular. We can think of the Arab, Arab Spring, the collapse of the Egyptian regime, the Tunisian regime, also the Libyan regime in Syria, what's hap what, what happened in Syria. It tends to be fairly spectacular and is easier to trace. And also autocrats don't talk about learning from each other. So finding success is a challenge, but I think that there are, it, the book has got, has examples of learning from success. Primarily one example is when, um, Nikolai Petrushev, the head of the Russian Security Council, goes to Algeria to find out how the Algerians overcame the Arabs, dealt with the Arab Spring, the protests in Algiers, what they went about, how they went about doing these different things. So you again have this idea of actually going out to talk, regular dialogue with uh, between autocracies. And also the autocracies learn from democracies. Sergei Kirienko who is in charge of the domestic um, section of the Russian presidential administration, has said that they took an awful lot from the Trump election campaign in America in terms of the social media, in terms of the need to try and make the bring uh, a younger generation who was more media savvy, more technological, wanting to use social media into the regime into supporting the regime and this was done through trying to get uh regime personnel less so putin but other people further down the line sergey sobyanin using twitter or x and sending out a few tweets every now and then um this was a way to try and get um younger people infused in the regime and this was taken from what was happening in terms of the trump campaign in 2016. So authoritarian learning is, is particularly learning from learning across the board, learning from autocracies, but also learning from democracies in order to develop the best survival practices. The second findings is, again, this sits in with the idea of diffusion, 
the spread of ideas. I think it's far more than that, that there is regular dialogue. These people are constantly meeting with each other. I remember when I started having an interview with someone who said, well, there's probably not that much need for learning because 90% of what they need can be found on Google or Yandex in the case of the post-Soviet space, that you can type in Zhanazen riots in Kazakhstan if you're in, let's say, Baku, and find out how the Kazakh regime dealt with those riots. But that that's all you need. So, But what I found was that these networks are extensive and that there are regular meetings between them. We know that in the union state of Russia and Belarus, every month, different ministries meet, personnel from ministries meet regularly every month. And they discuss what's been going on in Minsk, in Moscow, in the regions, and how they've overcome these problems. The same is also true of various interministerial commissions Less so now, but in the past, the Ukrainians and the Russian regimes were doing an awful lot in regards to that. So I think that what we're seeing is a very strong version of diffusion. I don't necessarily have a new word for this, but I think that it's more than the idea of the spread, the spread just the spread of ideas. And finally, another key aspect is the role of regional organizations in the post-Soviet space, and I suspect in other autocratic regions as well, think the Middle East and East Asia, we can see that regional organizations serve as learning rooms for autocracies. Again, they are a place for a venue for regular meetings. In regards to the Commonwealth of Independent States, there are meetings for presidents, for heads of government, prime ministers, for interior ministries, for foreign ministries, for um, security services, every six months. And these are formal meetings. There are also informal meetings. And we know for because they have generally signed the document that these people meet at the formal minister meetings. And we can assume that the ministers of the foreign ministers will meet at the informal meetings as well to discuss certain things. And we can also see in terms of what they talk about, the color revolutions, youth protests, neo-Nazis, that they are discussing events that are occurring in the region, the color revolution, the Orange Revolution, the Euromaidan, various protests as well. So these organizations play a key role, allowing dialogue, new learning opportunities as well. We also know that in regards to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which I appreciate isn't quite a post-Soviet organization, um, and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, that there are regular anti-terrorist um, exercises. And that some of these exercises, primarily the various brotherhood exercises of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, deal with the type of terrorists who take to the streets, wave banners, and march, and march, so protesters. They are trying to find ways to develop how to overcome protests. What is interesting is the 2011 uh, Brotherhood exercise, which was instigated by Ukraine under Viktor Yanukovych, who seems to have been the only one that didn't actually learn any of the lessons from how they overcame the protesters, whereas the Belarusians and the Russians and the Kazakhs were taking notes. But that's by the by. Collective, I think this is also important as well, as we can see from the table, Belarus and Russia are members of most of these organizations listed in the table. Belarus is also an observer of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and there is talk about it actually becoming a formal member in the near future. Whereas Ukraine having that, has now officially left the Commonwealth of Independent States and isn't a member of other organizations, Moldova is still just about hanging in the CIS. Um, but this is a problem. This is why it could be argued why, why Moldovan and Ukrainian regimes have not consolidated power, because they aren't formal, they aren't members of these organizations. And I think these regional organizations play a key role in understanding authoritarian learning in the post-Soviet space. So in terms of policy recommendations, I think. To an extent, Joe Biden was right to advocate for this. 
we know that there is a growing number. We know that there are more weak democracies and autocracies than there are consolidated democracies. We know that there are model autocratic models. Think Russia and China and even Singapore. There's, uh, China did take an awful lot from Singapore. And we know that they serve as models for weak democracies of aspiring authoritarians like Viktor Orban to try and shape or shape their own institutions domestically, trying to consolidate power and also to challenge established international norms and values. So democracy is very much, it's no longer a the only game in town, it's very much in competitive field and democracies need to come together in order to protect to better protect themselves democracies also need to stand up for the values that they promote and this comes in with the third point as well that they need to support civil society media and opposition within these countries and i'm sure we're going to discuss russia and ukraine uh, in the about and what's happening there and increasingly i'm of the opinion that perhaps a in regards to Russia, a university in exile needs to be established to help build, create the next generation for politicians, training journalists, and also teachers. I think that's increasingly important in regards to Russia as to what will happen in the future. But certainly democracies need to be able to do more, providing humanitarian visas, providing visas, student visas, allowing people to come. The idea of the university having an offline online courses as well for those who are still in belarus in russia in you in moldova and ukraine although i think it's less likely ukraine and moldova are going to be autocratized anytime soon i'm far more positive than i was when i wrote the book about ukraine and its path towards democratization and what i would like to conclude with is that we can we can see that autocrats always have to get it right that they are constantly having to adapt and they have to constantly get it right in order to stay in power and this makes it very hard because if you're coming in if you're dealing with mass protests let's say the arab arab spring has come to tunisia you've seen the tunisian government fall but you have protesters on the streets of cairo you have very little time to try and adapt and change so you'd use the same methods that Zini al Abedin Barali used, and it fails for you as Hosni Mubarak. Um, it takes a lot of time to change the situation, and autocracies have to constantly be able to adapt. Protesters only need to get it right once. If democracies increase the pressure on autocracies, that becomes very hard. There is one other option, which is to wait for the ivory tower syndrome, which possibly is what was happening in 2020 in Belarus, when Lukashenko thought he knew Belarusian society and so stopped paying attention to it. But this takes at least two decades. So Western states do not have that time frame. So this potentially is where I would like to end. I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, please, any questions? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that was a wonderfully insightful uh, summary of your book. Um, so I'd like to hand things over now to uh, Tom uh, to do the first response uh, to to Stephen's uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, Tom, do you, you do not have any slides from what I understand? No, no. I don't. So, I'll just talk so, a little bit. So if perhaps, Stephen, you uh, pull down your yes, slides. Sure. Yes, slides. Perfect. Great. Now the floor is yours, Tom. You have about. Well, I'm, minutes. I'm incredibly pleased to be here. Um, even virtually, I would love to have been on the other side of the pond, so to speak. Um, but uh, this is this is uh, really a great moment. Um, I've known Stephen uh, since he was a graduate student who took this off chance uh, just to reach out to me out of the blue um, and and ask about authoritarian learning as as if I knew something about it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he was so insightful, um, and had a real early grasp on it. It was before, even long before dissertating. Um, I think maybe you had your master's. I'm not even sure about that, uh, when we first connected. And you, this is in many ways, this book is a culmination of, 
at least one part of his career, the early part of his career. Of course, we have a, a huge future to look forward to uh, by identifying gaps in the literature and, and, and filling it. And I'm, I'm truly happy that Stephen has emerged as a, a leading scholar on, on this subject. Um, I hear from others um, his name pop up, and I think this book is really going to elevate him to the next level. Um, just I had an a, a article uh, that's uh, got an R&R, &R and they're like, well, you should mention uh, Hall's book in your R&R &R or in your revision. So I was like, oh, it's obviously getting some some uh, some uh, play there. So I'm really happy about uh, this book. Um, and I'm very pleased to call him a, a collaborator and a friend. So um, congratulations. But I want to talk about the book itself because that's what we're here for. So. There's many needles that Stephen is trying to thread in this book, and he's talked a lot about it. Um, there's a lot of concepts that that he's trying to bring together with authoritarian learning. I think he does an excellent job in doing that because authoritarian learning, if you want to think of it writ large, has had all this come from a lot of different places, a lot of different disciplines. Um, a lot of it has come to us from democracy studies and how democracies learn from each other and some of the same concepts that we learn from democ democratic learning, democratic diffusion, uh, democratic emula emulation didn't really apply fully to authoritarianism. There are some parallels, but I, uh, Stephen is, has done a great job at trying to adapt them, not just from democracy, but also to have it a, truly from an authoritarian experience and how that is different than how democracies learn from each other, even though authoritarians do learn from democracies. Also trying to thread the needle of trying to understand when we should consider it a success. And this is one of the, the tensions within the literature is if everything is learning, then nothing become is learning. So trying to figure out what is learning and what is occurring simultaneously and trying to really distinguish between the two. So that's something that Stephen's book does really well. And also embracing, uh, not just papering over, the real difficulty of proving that authoritarian learning is, is happening. Um, this is a tricky issue because we don't know what's going on inside these regimes. But almost by definition, they are black boxes. So we're trying to pull evidence from a variety of sources. And as, as Stephen does a very good job with, um, triangulate information by trying to understand, okay, we have these policies, we have the timing, we have these meetings going on, um, and, and really bringing in and, and these net, pre existing networks and trying to bring this all together to come to some real conclusion that we'll maybe eventually know um, if a, re a regime falls and we have the documents, like some of the Latin American regimes, uh, we know that about the learning um, because, well, those regimes fell and the archives got opened. But right now we're trying to do it while it's a moving target. And Stephen does a great job um, handling that. Also, um, the different aspects of authoritarian learning, which Stephen talked about, which I'm not gonna gonna repeat for him, uh, but or repeat, but I, I some things I think that were really key that where Stephen had really separated himself from the the established literature or the grow the the, the uh, early literature that uh, he built upon. Um, first of all, the, I think the most innovative thing, well, one of the most innovative things, a lot of innovative things here, but is the importance of Belarus, and that's always been key because Belarus was the leader of of this movement um, of of learning from the past and in particular learning from uh, the color revolutions and being proactive and being adaptive. Um, and then others took a lot of those lessons from Belarus because of course, as we know, um, at least uh, for a while uh, until the rise of Vladimir Putin, um, Belarus was the last dictatorship in Europe. Of course, now it's not the last, but that I think really undergirds Stephen's unique approach, because by focusing on Belarus early, uh, Stephen realized that it's not just coming from Russia, like um, many did, many thought it did. But in fact, it's much more of a horizontal process where 
Um, larger powers are learning from smaller powers and is much more of an interactive process between different authoritarian regimes. And also learning from both success and failure. In the Arab Spring literature, a lot of it was about uh, failure, but also successes. And this is something where the, the democracy learning, the democratic learning literature focus a lot on successes. And then Stephen's able to bring that and adapt it truly into the authoritarian context. And also, I, I think Stephen has done a, a great job at being innovative with internal learning, how these regimes learn from their own past. And it's not just external governments, as we had in our, our early definition, but in fact, taking that a step further and, under, and trying to understand how these regimes learn from what happened before. And of course, uh, Ukraine, Yanukovych didn't learn the right uh, uh, lessons um, from the uh, Orange Revolution in terms of how to potentially stop that, because of course he was overthrown. But certainly there was some notion that we uh, of attempting to consolidate in a way that would, for him, avoid um, what ultimately would, would occur to him, but the importance of internal learning as well. So it's it's not just Stephen pulling together a variety of threads um, and, and trying to pull together a variety of literatures uh, that were kind of disparate, but also focusing on what he is bringing to the table here and these kind of innovative um, and, and being kind of a forerunner of what I think will be a, a research agenda, not for just for himself, but one that will hopefully spur research agendas for others. And um, I'm looking forward to the day when Stephen tells me that some graduate student um, emails him out of the blue and says, uh, hey, let's collaborate. Let's talk. So congratulations, Stephen. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and uh, I'm, I can actually see Stephen blushing through the, the Zoom camera. Um, so uh, we now move to, uh, to Golnaz, uh, who will also have 10 minutes uh, as a respondent. So over to you. OK. OK. Yeah, I don't want too much blushing to happen. So <laughs> all right. Now, Stephen, congratulations on the book. Um, I think uh, I want to start with two points. Both uh, one is fortunate, one is unfortunate. The fortunate thing is that I think this book has been waiting for the author and uh, this idea and the concept was waiting to be implemented and written out. And now we have this book and, and um, uh, thank you for writing it. Now, the unfortunate thing is that, um, unfortunately, it is a sign of our times uh, that, um, that uh, we uh, scholars need to focus on uh, authoritarian um, learning and authoritarian transmission and enlargement and competition to, to democracies because in a way the book comes on the back foot of um, democratic learning, right? And um, the first decade of the 21st century, I think um, we saw a lot of research going into democratic diffusion and technologies of color revolutions being learned between different regimes, etc. So it was the, the, the empirical story was about how grassroots organizations, international organizations, political leaders find each other and learn from each other as to how to overthrow the autocratic or corrupt governments and um, bring in democracy. And now we are past that phase and we are into sort of an opposite phase. And if we look at it in terms of competition, you know, what does it tell us about um, uh, the competition between uh, autocracy and democracy. And I think that is one of the reasons why the book is timely. And it is one of the reasons why the book is policy relevant. I would say that uh, United Kingdom and many other democratic governments are very much interested in precisely in this issue of uh, authoritarian, you know, diffusion, competition and, and technologies. And uh, so that brings me to the how um, early on uh, in you know for 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 the students of Russian um, politics, we had this um, Russians using the term politechnology, right? Somehow in the nineteen nineties and two thousands, um, you had um, the experts who were good at specific things, at how to get elected, at how to get a certain candidates into power. And, and, and the, 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 the jargon, the conceptualization was around this term 
technology, right? Which is, you know, uh, by itself implies that there is innovation going on, that there is learning going on, and that there is diffusion of such technologies that is going on. The only bad thing is that in the 90s, it was about elections, but it's interesting how that technocratic frame quite seamlessly turned into an autocratic and authoritarian frame because it is those, you know, Gleb Pavlovskis who were political technologies um, enabling victory of specific chosen candidates who were also at the, very much at the basis of at least Russian uh, authoritarian system emergence. So, so, so that's the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate uh, thing about the times. And, um, but, you know, the, the book is very needed and, and I'm sure it will attract a lot of um, intellectual, public, academic attention. And um, um, nonetheless, um, the book for me also uh, spurred a lot of questions and um, thinking about how the theorizing of authoritarian learning could and should be taken further. And so I will be asking those questions. And in fact, some of these questions are already emerging at the Q&A. So they will be in a way you can fold several questions into into same ones. So if we look at your book as a sign of times, right? About, um, you know, that the times switched from democratic diffusion and democratic transmission into authoritarian learning, right? I mean, what does it tell us uh, about uh, authoritarian learning as a phenomena being a new temporary, temporally delimited phenomena. And if we look at it, so, so in your thinking, you know, is authoritarian learning something new that is happening um, or has it happened before as well? Or is it something that has happened all the time, but because of the special times we live in, and then what are those special times? What are the key factors that might be different in these times that did not exist, say, for Nazi Germany or for monarchical authoritarian systems uh, of, 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 of uh, historically existing? Uh, what is happening today that should bring uh, further attention on this phenomenon? Is it is it the time of intense communication and and the ease of transferring of information uh, and uh, you know uh, if 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 it's that then you know that might bring your book and your theory into conversation with um, for example the the concept of informational autocracies right Guriev and Triesman right where you know so so in a way there, theory then about how today autocrats rely on information to govern as opposed to on repression and and that's their learning you know that's that's what they've learned uh, or that's how they've used the new available technologies um you know how would you position your theory vis-a-vis -vis such more temporally historically grounded type um, approaches to autocracy today, to modern autocracy. So that would be one sort of this, this issue of temporality and temporal delimitation. The second one is also temporal and that is linked to your uh, case selection because your cases, well, all four of them are um, in the post-communist world. And, uh, and this is something that brings me to also the question that is on the chat on that, the Q and A that, you know, is, is authoritarian, you know, uh, if we look at regional based learning, is there something with say communist legacies or historical legacies that that might play a role in network building, in the intensity of ties and interconnections in the language that people speak and therefore ease of communication? Or are we talking about similar technologies, techniques, strategies of governance that could be moved from post-communist region to Latin American, African, um, East Asian region, etc. right? Is there a geographical pattern that could be noted or observed in, in, uh, in, in this, um, in this, in this uh, approach on, on authoritarian learning? Uh, my next question is, if we are uh, the role of ideology, 
in building the concept of authoritarian learning. Because if there is democratic learning, what's the difference? Is the difference simply that Democrats wants to stay in power using specific institutions and having certain limits and accountability and um, constraining institutions, whereas in the authoritarian system, there are no such constraints or they are of a different type. Uh, but if the power survival in power is the the same logic, uh, then then what's what's different about learning uh, of democratic leaders, uh, democratic institutions from authoritarian leaders and authoritarian regimes? So what is the difference? Is there a difference between authoritarian and democratic learning? And then following up on that sort of the ideological underpinnings, can authoritarian learning be good? Because the assumption here is that autocracies are bad, they're bad for their populations, and, you know, they are learning anything, you know, all the strategies to stay in power. But you yourself bring uh, attention to the case of Singapore, for example, how um, the Russian, and uh, I know better even the regional elites, I know how from Tatarstan, the president of Tatarstan has traveled to Singapore many times to learn some strategies of how to, you know, how to achieve economic, um, you know, prosperity, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, and then if, if such learning brings, you know, economic advancement, if such learning from Singapore brings you know, this model of Lee Kuan Yew who, who, who brought some technocratic governance to new levels um, and, and, and it brings, you know, prosperity to, to people living in autocracies. Is there a possibility for such learning or do we look at any type of learning as bad? So what's the normative, I guess, um, implications and the normative uh, frame that, that, that you are um, building on? Um, then there is an issue of temporality, and I do have many questions. I don't probably shouldn't uh, go on too long on that because we should open it up. But you know, is is the knowledge that is gained through learning is it temporal? Temporal in terms of is it like you know, is like Machiavelli political realism? There are certain things that don't change that you know autocrats can follow, or are there are there things that are really fresh and new that that could be used? Um, that's 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 another um, another question that I had, and then and then there is um, another thing, another issue that I wanted to bring your attention to, and that is when we look at learning from success and from failure, and the good examples you're using is Orange Revolution and 2014 Crimea. I don't know if you're looking at 2014 Crimea, but I, I'm bringing that in as a success case, from which Putin has learned as something that's brought him such a great. Um, kick in his popularity and and uh, etc and and it made for uh, a simpler euphoric thinking uh, about what could happen if you know <laughs> the russian military invades ukraine and they can quickly sort of um, uh, uh, subdue the country and people would uh, go out and, and support the russian troops to what extent the successes and and failures could lead to an emotional type reaction where the threat of orange revolution could actually lead to irrational, not learning, but irrational behavior because it's driven by fear. And whenever it's driven by fear or euphoria, the learning assumes that there is a rationality involved. But, but um, you know, if leaders are doing something out of fear, there is a space for mistake. There is a space for overshooting. There is a space for miscalculation. There is a space for, you know, uh, expectations not being met because they are not grounded, but are driven by uh, emotions. And how do we deal with such reactions? Because learning is a very rational concept, and yet things that happen, eventuality is very emotionally um, driven as well. And then. Uh, how does that might uh, interfere with uh, some of your um, observations? I think let me stop on that and just say again, I think this is a very needed um, intervention into the literature on authoritarianism and authoritarian resilience and something that uh, we will be uh, engaging with in terms of further questions and further discussions. So thank you for giving that opportunity.
Thank you, Gulnaz. Um, so we we have two questions from the audience, and and please do send in your questions, and then I'll turn it over to Stephen to respond. And and uh, one question, as as highlighted uh, in, in by the by one of the responses, relates to this idea of an authoritarian playbook and whether or not that playbook of lessons learned is going to be operated on a sort of cookie cutter basis. Uh, across the region, or will there be distinctive uh, regional variations or, or continental variations of that, that playbook of learning? Uh, the second relates to the differences between how democracies and autocracies learn. Uh, and of course, this was highlighted by, by both the respondents and, and by Stephen uh, about this issue of democratic learning, but also autocratic learning and the ideological factors. Um, and do you think that autocracies are better at learning now than democracies, and uh, and is this only because autocracies, uh, as you highlighted, are under this this constant pressure environment uh, for survival? Um, and uh, with all of those uh, thorny questions, uh, as well as as uh, as as praise, I hand over to, uh, to Stephen to respond. Well, thank you. Um, sorry, I've lost my voice now. Um, no, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> to uh tom and to gunas and to the anonymous uh i think uh questioner um so to begin with gunas's i count six questions um which is is great um is authoritarian learning something new i would say no i would say that it's been there for a long while i mean kurt Vyland. I think, uh, wrote an article about how, it was it Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary uh, found out about the 1848 revolutions in various parts of the, Europe by writing letters um, and then was able to instigate uh, a counter-revolution when necessary, obviously helped by Tsar Nicholas I as well um, and what he got up to, the gendarme of Europe. So I think that, although, and we've seen in terms of whilst Hitler and Stalin may not necessarily have learned from each other, that certainly uh, some regimes learned from them. Joseph Pilsudski obviously didn't quite go to the same extent of Hitler's uh, final solution, but in terms of a military dictatorship in Poland, I think you can make that case. Um, I think a case as well of the Soviet Union. Yes, obviously, with the satellite states, it was an imposition, but certainly some uh, countries tried to follow the Soviet Union, particularly after the decolonization of Africa and possibly of East Asia as well. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily new. What I think is interesting is, as Daniel Treisman and Sergei Guriev um, talk about with spin dictators, how the technology has been used in terms of how it's been uh, framed today, the different intricacies that no longer, well, Russia perhaps is changing to a non-spin dictatorship today, but in the past, certainly it was using spin uh, spin tactics, use of the media, legitimization of the personal regime, these sort of things, um, communication in order to make sure that uh, it would legitimize itself amongst the wider populace, and then need to only need to send the signals, uh, the pressive signals to the opposition, to journalists, to stay in line, these sort of things. And I think that certainly is fascinating as to how the different practices have developed over time. But I think authoritarian learning has always been there within autocracies. I think that it is something that has become, as we've looked at democratic learning in the 1990s and trying to understand autocratic survival today, that it's become particularly prominent now, because I think it's a key part of the development of authoritarian learning. Um, in terms of your second question, and also the first question, I think, uh, of the out outside uh, question, um, is there something different in post-Soviet regions to post-Soviet regimes to other regions? Yes and no. I, I know that sounds like a cop-out, but I'm going to go with it. Um, I think that there are uh, certain parts, because the Soviet Union, the post-Soviet space, does have the networks of the former 
Soviet networks of elites working together, it does have the institutions that to a great extent have just been relabeled, unless you're Belarus, where the KGB has largely remained the KGB. Um, it is pretty much the same, um, does use certain practices and Putin as well, being a former KGB agent has used KGB, the KGB playbook to an extent as well. But I think that authoritarian regimes are looking at survival. That is ultimately the purpose, uh, at least from what I look at in the book, of why authoritarian regimes learn. They are learning in order to survive. And therefore, there are only a finite number of practices that can be used. So I think that certainly the post-Soviet region is both individualistic and not. Uh, as <laughs> I think that there are certain practices that span Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, East Asia, but the post-Soviet region has its own distinctiveness, as it were. I think as well that what we can see is that if we were to look at Latin regimes in Latin America, particularly way back in the in the, not to say way back in the 1970s and the 1980s, we would see certain practices being developed between the Brazilian, Argentine, Argentinian, and Chilean juntas. And the same would also be the case in Africa, possibly because of the way these organ these regions are interconnected as well. That they do have best practice, they do have regular dialogue, autocrats, military regimes will, uh, from my understanding, they did have regular talk, they would train with each other, military uh, armies regularly do that. And in terms of Africa as well, we see organizations such as ECOWAS or the Association of West African States, they do meet with one another and that is also a way for these regimes to develop those networks. So. I think also coming to the third question, what's the difference between democratic and authoritarian learning? Ultimately, as I as I said in the in the theory section, or I didn't allude to it, this there is very little in terms of the theoretical side that's different. What I think that I was what I was trying to do in the book is say that autocrats ultimately are all about survival, because if they're not, it's going to be it could be nasty, brutish, and short for them. Whereas Democrats have the possibility that yes, they may lose an election, but generally in a democracy, at least an established democracy, if Rishi Sunak loses the next election, he's unlikely to end up in prison or possibly worse. He may lose his position as prime minister. He may never uh, stand again as a politician, but people in the Conservative Party are unlikely to end up in jail. They will still stay in Parliament, at least some of them, and they have a chance in the future to form the next form another government. Whereas, once Vladimir Putin loses power, it's unlikely, unless something tragic happens, that Vladimir Putin is going to become the president again in 2030. Um, so we don't, we simply don't know. So it is all about developing best survival practices because it, if it tends, if it goes bad, it tends to be terminal. Now, in terms of can authoritarian learning be good, and I, I like your example of Tatarstan and Kazan, I think that's particularly relevant. I know that uh, I get from talking to people as well that yes, in Tatarstan, the elite was talking to various, to Kazakhstan as well, I think, and Singapore and probably Turkey uh, as well because of the ties uh, between Tatarstan and these countries. Singapore has certainly been a particularly important model. We know that Deng Xiaoping in China said, we need to look at Singapore. We want to have the economic um, model that Singapore has. And I think that authoritarian learning can be good in that respect. It can. It is autocracies because it's a way to legitimize themselves amongst their public. We are increasingly seeing the idea, as Roberto Ferro would talk about, of autocratic modernization as a way to a legitimation tool for autocracies. And I think this is also the case. Russia is obviously a vast country. Um, Singapore is quite small. But I think for Tatarstan, looking at Singapore and saying, well, we, we can do that. We have oil. We have the resources. We can follow the Singaporean model and build a better 
community, better society, a richer society with an autocratic uh, political system within uh, within Tatarstan that will be acceptable to Moscow. So I think that certainly authoritarian learning can be good as a way to help develop uh, d- develop legitimation for autocracies. Because again, you want to make sure you have a large winning coalition for when things go bad. You want to make sure that you have legitimation amongst society because then hopefully most of society won't go out and protest when an economic recession happens or a protest happens or such things. In terms of question five, I put down, is there anything new? And I'm now confused by what I actually meant when I wrote that. Um, so could you, could you possibly just say, say again what uh, you meant by... Sorry, go on that. No, in terms of, you know, because if learning is not a new phenomenon, mm. right, but technologies are new or any other factors in terms of inter- interconnections, um, globalization and and you know so so do we need some temporal boundaries for authoritarian learning in the 21st century that would distinguish it from from other periods of time oh okay i think certainly because of the way the globalized network that we live in the world of communications you know the autocrats can uh talk with one another outside their regions and i think that's also something that we're starting to see um for you know in terms of i'll use the example of belarus where lukashenko has at various times tried to stop the uh rel- over reliance on russia so that has mean that has meant speaking to ahmadinejad in iran hugo chavez in venezuela there's now a couple of streets in minsk i think named after chavez um and also the economic relationship that he's developed with zimbabwe and various other african states Yes, he's flown out to Africa, but there are regular meetings in terms of on the phone, at least from my understanding of the presidential portal of Belarus. So I think that autocrats, it is going, it's going outside the region. And I think this also fits into the idea that is the post-Soviet region different? Increasingly not, because autocracies are able to are increasingly communicating with one another outside of their regions. They're sharing best practices, and I alluded to it when I said about Nikolai Petrushev actually going to Algeria to find out how the how the Algerian regime had been so successful in stopping an Arab Spring. The same is also true of various other places as well. We've seen Victor Scheinman go to uh, the head of the Belarusian presidential administration go to China on numerous occasions to find out about the Great Firewall and trying to implement a lesser firewall in Belarus. So I think this is certainly important. Um, and in terms of if leaders are doing something out of fear, I didn't mention Crimea because, as I said, the book was already going to print when Putin invaded, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And certainly I think that Crimea was used as, well, it was successful, no one died, it was done very quickly. If we can do this on a larger scale, Three days will be in Kiev. If we attack from the north, if we land at Hostomel Airport, Yanukovych is already in Minsk. He's ready and waiting for us to implant him. We'll remove Zelensky. Jobs are good. By the time the West has finished its breakfast, everything will be sorted and you'll just have to accept it. Um, and I think certainly Crimea does play a key example. I think also the fact that he saw the his poll ratings rise astronomically. To an extent, it was a, legit- a new attempt at legitimation. That's why Navalny was arrested as well when he was. Um, so I think it was it was certainly the Crimea example is key. I wouldn't necessarily say, say that it's fear, though. I think as I'm trying to get my head around having learned very little about psychology over my lifetime uh, in terms of working on this an article at the moment, trying to understand the role that Ukraine plays in Putin's thinking. I think he's consistently said, and he's alluded to it at various times, that Ukraine is U- Ukraine is, base, is Russia to a great extent. Russians are, Ukrainians are heretical Russians. Um, and I think there is a, co- a cognitive bias in Putin's thinking. And I think this also plays a role in terms of authoritarian learning. That yes, 
fear does play a role in terms of making mistakes. Daniel Treisman has said about this, that autocrats don't ever think, wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to hold free and fair elections tomorrow. They democratise because they make a mistake, because they're constantly adapting, and they adapt because they are fearful, possibly. So it does play a role, certainly. I think it's certain, also the failure to learn is also there when there is a mind block, as it were, within the thinking of the regime. We can see this in terms of the protests in 2020 in Belarus. Lukashenko believed that Belarusian society had changed very little since 2010, when he faced the last time he faced significant protests. In 2015, there had been very little, pro few protests. In 2020, obviously, it spiralled. But um, I think that he misunderstood how society in Belarus had changed. And I think Putin has misunderstood, in regards to the invasion of Ukraine, misunderstood Ukraine. As Kushma famously said in his book, Ukraine is not Russia. Um, so that is something that I think Putin has failed to learn. But we can discuss this in more detail. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know if that's answered your question. I apologize. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think we can very much see that there's uh, an awful lot of food for thought in this book, uh, and it has triggered a wonderful set of questions. Um, the book is The Authoritarian International, Tracing How Authoritarian Regimes Learn in the Post-Soviet Space by Cambridge University Press. As you can see, it's very erudite and eloquent author Stephen Hall. Uh, has just begun to scratch the surface of what appears to be a very deep vein of research uh, into the future. And I do hope to be able to hear more from him about the, the role of universities in exile, uh, most especially since already within the European Union, the U European uh, uh, University, uh, Central European University has had to go into exile uh, into from Budapest to Vienna. Um, so I just thought uh, is now for me to thank uh, Stephen, Tom and Golnaz for a wonderfully uh, interesting and erudite conversation uh, this afternoon, evening, depending on where you are um, and um, all the way from Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> um, and uh, to remind everyone that uh, this is the first of our many uh, uh, seminars that will be held online and in person and in hybrid over the next few months. The next one will take place on the 11th of October with Professor Gwyn Bevan uh, on the, his new book, How Did Britain Come to This? A Century of Systematic Failures of Governance, um, which I'm sure that uh, our audience and our participants today will be very interested to know how Britain has arrived uh, to, with leaking ro roofs in all its schools to, uh, today. So please come and join us again soon. And this recording will be online uh, on YouTube and on SoundCloud and accessible from the IPR's website at the University of Bath uh, very shortly. And uh, have a very good evening to you all. Thank you.